Welcome to Future Docs Podcast. My name is Pedram Mizani. I'm a family physician and the chief clinical officer here at AC Medical and uh, your co-host of Future Docs Podcast. And I'm your other co-host, Cody Fan, a healthcare writer and editor at AC Medical. As always, I invite you all to watch the video version of this podcast by visiting us on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash AC Medical org. Today's episode, episode 29, this is going to be part two of the two-part series from last week. The title of this episode is Impact of Step 1, Pass-Fail, International Medical Graduates. Now, you'll see that we've uh, created these two episodes just ahead of our scheduled webinar on August 4th, The Impacts of USMLE Step 1, Pass-Fail, plus CS Cancellation. Dr. Mazzani, big news announced for some time now that USMLE Step scores will be converted to Pass-Fail starting January 1st, 2022. Why did this occur? Thank you, Cody. There was a lot of uh, stakeholder discussion before this decision was made. You know, in today's podcast, we're going to be focusing on our international medical graduates and, and international medical graduates were also involved in these stakeholder meetings. And to sum it up, it really had a lot to do with the stress that it was placing on the test takers. This is both financially, uh, from a time perspective, some of them were losing hope that the specialty that they always wanted to secure was no longer in reach if their step one score was not high enough. And really this all stemmed from a lot of residency programs relying on USMLE step one for so long in order to sift through residency applications. They needed something quick to be able to just differentiate who they want to go ahead and invite. And they used to use step one score a lot. And that's what really led to a lot of these changes because the National Board of Medical Examiners came out and said, look, the USMLEs were designed as a sequence of tests to evaluate the, the licensability of a physician. It was not designed for helping residency program directors look through residency applications and try to streamline that process. What does this mean for international medical graduates who have already taken step one and may have failed? You know, if you've taken step one, have you failed and you're right here in, in this crossroads of step one becoming pass and fail, then of course the score is going to be visible on your transcript. And the second time that you take it, there's not going to be a score on there. You know, attempts to residency program directors have always been more important than the score that you secure on USMLE. So in a, in a way, not much has changed. If there's a failure on your USMLE, then really the impact that has already had on your application is there, regardless of it being pass or fail. So if you fail USMLE once, and then you all of a sudden get a 240, it doesn't really make up for the fact that you failed it once. So our recommendation to you, if you've taken step one and you failed it is really not much different than than we were recommending beforehand, which is, you know, you have to strengthen the rest of your application. And we have many, many podcasts that, that discuss that. But to be more specific, if one area of a program director selection criteria diminishes, then you have to go in and fix the other most next most important factor. So for example, in family medicine, letters of recommendation are more important than step one or two CK scores of so step one you fail, then you have to strengthen your levels of recommendation and, and possibly commitment to specialty. And then once you have a very, very complete application, knowing that this, this, this flaw is there, this red flag is there, you have to discuss it in your personal statement. You have to get professional help so you can, you can discuss it in the interviews appropriately. So it doesn't sound like, uh, you know, you're just uh, constantly sorry and, and just lost hope because of the step one failure. So you need some help there. And then you got to put your application in front of the most number of programs that you can afford in one specialty because you know there's only going to be between five to ten percent of the programs that will take an applicant seriously if they've had multiple attempts and it's not because you're not a good applicant it's just that you know the volume of applications that there are so you have to you have to play the same game which is applying to more programs with a more complete application and of course that raises concerns for those that have not yet taken step one for those that have not yet taken it should they wait to ensure the transcript shows pass fail you know it, it really depends on 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 your situation if if you're ready for this match cycle let's say for the you know for the, the upcoming 2022 match and the only exam that's pending is your step one or you've already passed the the other exams and and you've done well in them and you feel pretty good on step one to wait until december and and not take it means that you're going to push your entire match for another year and who knows what's going to happen next year so i think it's a really a case-by-case -case basis and also keep in mind that 
obtaining an ECFMD certification is going to constantly become more difficult. And for example, as of this year, the total number of attempts that any examinee may take on a step or step component has been reduced from six down to four. And, you know, for, for many IMGs, this is not applicable because many of them don't get to that high of a number, but still it is an indication that these things are getting tough and there's other things that are happening too, which, which I'm sure we're going to discuss in just a moment. Now, you assembly step exams traditionally play a significant role on whether applicants receive interviews, even though that was never the intention. What are the implications here? You know, um, all of these changes can impact the motivation of an international medical graduate to whether, you know, they want to put up with all of these changes or, or go through all of these steps and, and, and deal with all of these uncertainties. There was an interview with the uh, Foundation for Advancement of International Medical Education and Research, FAMER. It's a division of Education you know, Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates. And their traditional advice, whenever IMGs would ask them, they would travel all over the world and IMGs would ask them, well, how do I you know, how do I improve my application to get in? They used to say, you know, you would need to complete some U.S. clinical observerships. You know, it would be good to have some publications and research studies. It's really good to have networking in the United States and showcase that, you know, and, and apply to programs that that have a track record of, of accepting IMGs. And then your U.S. MLE score, they used to recommend that. And primarily step one score, they can't say that anymore. You know, that that just shows you how, you know, how deep rooted this this issue is for international medical graduates. You know, uh, from from one sense, moving to pass fail may relieve just like a deep stress of needing to secure a really high score on step one. But you know th that that could just very easily now be shifted to US Assembly Step Two CK, and that is a that is a real concern. What happens if they take Step Two CK and they get a really low score? Does that mean that they're not going to sit for step one anymore because they think that it's going to be worthless? And and what about the program directors? Because you're you're not going to stop program directors from looking for a quantitative way, a fast, a quick way of being able to just take a bunch of applications out of their viewing pool. So, but I mean, certainly this is a huge step forward. So could program directors not just look at step two CK and just, just, you know, for the stress to be shifted over. And then on top of all this, there is the new added pressure of, of all the schools that have graduates who are applying for ECFMG certification or, or, or US MLEs, they must be accredited. And so if, if the school that an IMG is graduated from is not accredited for whatever reason, and that certainly can have significant impacts. You know, all in all, the, the implications are that there's got to be change and, and we just got to have to be able to get ahead of it. And there, we need to have other metrics and we need to be able to help our, our fellow international medical graduates out so that, 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 that they stay in the match and they continue to apply their, their, their incredible resources for, for U.S. healthcare and for the world. You mentioned all in all, there needs to be change. Overall, is step one becoming pass fail? A good thing for IMGs? Well, you know, I think this really has to do, do with, with which group of IMGs we were talking about. I think for, for every single IMG, I think it discourages the students from just cramming for, for that exam. And I think that's a really good thing. I remember myself cramming to the point where I would, you know, I would take two months off between my basic sciences and my clinical years. And I, I would cram for step one. And it was, you know, you stay in a hotel with a buddy and and you wake up at five in the morning and you go to bed at one o'clock in the morning and all you do is just, you know, questions, questions, questions. And, you know, that's it's not the way to study for medicine. So for all, I think it, that's a that's a good thing. But again, that could be shifted to step two. Now, what is the, the different groups that we're talking about? Let's say U.S. international medical graduates. These are U.S. citizens that don't need visa sponsorships. Most of them are attending four year schools. Now, these four year schools are located in the Caribbean for the most part. They're located in the Caribbean. The curriculum are, is is pretty similar to what we see here in the United States. And so their transition, you know, to a pass fail step one means that their school would have to, most likely that means that they're gonna focus more on step two CK, clinical knowledge. So their school can very easily incorporate those clinical components of, of medical education a lot earlier in, in the year. So to them, that transition may be a lot simpler to, to have those curriculum modified. Now, everywhere else in the world, it's a six year curriculum, right? Six, seven, eight years curriculum. And, and those medical school deans, those medical schools uh, may not be motivated by a few U.S. bound graduates that, uh, that, that need to have a, a greater emphasis on, on clinical component of, of medical education than the basic sciences. And they, they, so they may not include clinical skills in their earlier years curriculum. 
again, there just needs to be other differentiating metrics to differentiate IMGs uh, in this entire application pool. You mentioned other metrics for our international medical graduates to differentiate themselves. What are they? You know, in, in the 2021 match, we saw some creative ways of program directors uh, trying to deal with this step one pass fail. And, and even though the step one pass fail was not implemented in 2021 match, it's going to be implemented in the middle of the 2022 match. What a lot of graduate medical educations did is they used it as a, as a trial period where they blinded the review committees to the USMLE performances of the candidates. And so they use other metrics like thalamus. Uh, we're not related to thalamus. We're not affiliated with them and not promoting them. But that's one of the things that they did. It's a it's a it's a way to rank, you know, from a cognitive perspective and you know from a decision making perspective of of individuals. How do they deal with you know seemingly challenging standardized cases? And they use some pretty interesting methodologies. Like you know because they couldn't leave and they couldn't do this in a in a test center, they, they, you know, there was somebody that was proctoring them, looking at them through the camera as they're taking the examination. There was, there's just a lot of really neat ways where they're using technology to score and rank a candidate uh, based on different standardized assessment tools. So that's, that's one of the ways, you know, outside of the United States medical license examination. Another thing that we do at AC Medical is after every one of our clinical blocks, whether it's a student or a graduate, we, we have our attending physicians evaluate the the rotators based on ACGME core competencies on a scale of zero to five. And those can be attached to letters of recommendation so that the the review committees have an objective way to make a subjective letter of recommendation, make it a lot more real and, and residency relevant. So that's that's one of the ways. So just kind of going around other ways of, of assessing a candidate. Here at AC Medical, there's a lot of tools that we use before we hire our employees where we check their you know, typing skills and we check, you know, their, their decision-making skills and, and, uh, you know, we get a score, uh, based on that. And, and sometimes we use that to, to invite somebody for an interview or not invite them for an interview. You know, another thing that I think is going to be very important for IMGs is to really keep track of, of all that they've accomplished. You do that in a form of a resume or a CV, but maybe like an electronic portfolio, which, which could be very easily shared with residency programs that maintains your relevant experiences and, and, and shows that what you've been doing to stay up to date when it comes to residency preparedness and any other credentials that you earn. Now, a lot of them do this through ERAS application, but you know, once you certify in ERAS, it can't change. So this has to be a lot more organic. And from a residency programs perspective, there is, there is definitely going to be changes. And some of the things that we foresee is a lot greater usage of technology in the residency interview process. And we saw, um, we saw a lot of, uh, actually, we saw a lot of that, but it was very, very basic because all that we really did is we just interviewed people online without having them to come down. And it looks like it's going to stick and their programs are going to continue doing that this match cycle as well in 2022. But we suspect that they're probably going to offer uh, some sort of a hybrid. But imagine Imagine if there are programs where you're know, using artificial intelligence, uh, you, you could go through applications a lot faster and you wouldn't need a, a human to go through it because the problem here is time, right? If you have one residency coordinator and you have one program director, you know, for a program with, with seven residents and you have 3000 applications, it's humanly impossible to go through it. But what if you can use artificial intelligence to do that, right? To go through letters of recommendation, to look for you know, red flags or keywords or trigger words that will get you to say, oh, you know, this is really good for our program. And then, and, and finally, your, your presence online and, and social media, I can't stress this enough. It is so easy. We just go online, type your name in just to see how many followers you got, what kind of photos you put up. Uh, and then you could also turn that around and make that really positive for you. You know, if you can show your community involvement and, and your commitment to specialty in, in some pretty creative ways. So those are just some other ways for IMGs where they could differentiate themselves. And you know, so hopefully this was helpful to you all. It certainly was. That concludes this Future Dogs podcast episode number 29. If you're listening to the podcast, be sure to watch the video form on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash AC Medical Org. Yeah, I want to I want to thank all of our listeners, especially those that are international medical graduates and are going through all of these changes, especially with the step two CS cancellation and and you know the additions of pathways and and the hoops that you got to jump through. And I just want to tell you that it's worth it. And you know the more challenging it gets, those that are the most committed are going to stick around and. 
those that are the most committed are ones that that you want to be, you know, your physicians and and your care providers, and and that's who you are. And so stick with it. It just it's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you tougher. And uh, and that's what you need to survive residency and and really come out the leader that you need to be. So everything happens for a reason. Do not give up. Do not be discouraged. Uh, everything will work out for you. Just you know, get really proper mentorship and you know stay positive and motivated. Everybody's going through it together. And of course, I just want to give another reminder as well. We do have another webinar upcoming on August 4th, detailing the impacts of the U Assembly step exam changes in depth. So if you would like to register, feel free to go to acmedical.org forward slash residency dash prep or acmedical.org forward slash online dash meetings. Either web page works, you'll be able to find all of the webinar resources there as well. I also want to thank you for your time, Dr. Mazzani. And, and thank you for yours, Cody. And if you're listening after August, you know, sometime in 2022, 2023, make sure to go to our youtube.com forward slash AC Medical Org and look at the webinar that Cody was talking about, the recorded version of it. And make sure you take a look at the question and answers too, where, you know, the chats that we have with, with our audiences, those are usually pretty lively and, and uh, very helpful. So thank you for your time, everyone. We'll see you in the next podcast episode.